Professor uh, Ensley uh, got his PhD at Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart in 18, uh, 1989. Uh, he went for a postdoc at the uh, University of California in Santa Barbara. He came back to uh, Munich and uh, had a position there from 91 to 95. And since October 95, he has been a professor at uh, ETH Zurich in, uh, in, in Switzerland. And since 2011, he's the director of the National Center for Competence in Research on Quantum Science and Technology. So it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Klaus to give us uh, the first colloquium in this semester. He's going to talk about transport through to, uh, twisted graphene layers, gaps, devices, and interactions. Uh, Professor Klaus, thank you very much for giving us a talk. Thank you very much, George. And also thank you very much, Edson, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. Um, I remember very well my visit to U Uberlandia, which was, I think, uh, 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it was wonderful. I would love to be there with you guys now, but uh, we will do everything online here. So, as the title suggests, I will talk about twisted graphene layers. It seems these days uh, uh, everybody talks about twisted graphene. But before we go to twisted graphene, I will tell you a little bit about untwisted graphene to motivate the latter part of the talk. And also because <clears throat> even in plain single graphene and bilayer graphene, there are still interesting things to be discovered. Let me mention my collaborators here. <clears throat> So Chuyao, Rebecca are PhD students that did most of the quantum dot work. Annika was a postdoc. Caroline also worked on quantum dots as Veronica. You see, we have ladies in the beginning that we are very proud that we have so many female scientists. Adrian just joined us as a postdoc. Corina is a master's student. Peter is a postdoc. Foco is a postdoc. Julia is another PhD student. So Julia and Elias, Peter and Peter, they work, <coughs> excuse me, on the twisted layers. And uh, all of this work is, of course, done together with Thomas. So let me start out with a schematic. Uh, this is a schematic of gallium arsenide. So this is the good old days when graphene was not around. And uh, gallium arsenide is still a very good material today. What you see here is a substrate. Then there's a two-dimensional electron gas, high mobility. And on top of the entire sample, there is a gate architecture. and by applying negative voltages to these gates, you can deplete the electron gas underneath. So let's look at this huge black stripe here, no electrons. That's a negative voltage to this top middle electrode. Then you have all the other electrodes here on the lower part of the sample that allows you to confine individual electrons and single, double, or triple quantum dots. And then there's a charge detector on the other side. So this is our workhorse or has been our workhorse for the last 15 years, and I think uh, I, I, a large community has worked that, that way. So I would say gallium arsenide is the pioneer, but because gallium arsenide has been around for such a long time, it's not so easy as an experimentalist to do something new, because basically everything has been done, everything that you can imagine, and you need a really smart idea to move on. And if you want to build qubits, another buzzword these days that people would like to build, then gallium arsenide is not the best material because electron spins in gallium arsenide, they couple to nuclear spins and there's strong uh, spin orbit interaction. So you can do proof of principle experiments, but coherence times are not good in gallium arsenide and they will never be. So now people work with silicon and silicon, I think, of course, is even older than gallium arsenide. It has been revived these days because it's compatible with industry and because you can have long coherence times for spins, because you can make silicon without nuclear spins and spin orbit interaction is very, very weak. So many, many groups these days work on silicon to, for, to make novel quantum bits uh, to build a quantum computer. Now, I will show you something else, graphene. Graphene is interesting from the physics point of view. I think everybody would agree with that. But we have to understand how we can use it to build interesting quantum devices. And that's actually not that simple. 
So many people work with graphene, not so many people work with uh, uh, quantum devices, but actually it's a good material because graphene is everywhere. And I, I guess you guys are from Brazil. You just uh, uh, had your South America Cup. I'm very sorry for what happened in the final, but anyway, um, you might know that we had simultaneously the European Cup. And of course, Switzerland never made it to the final, but Switzerland made it as far as never before. So uh, we are playing on a different level soccer as you guys. Okay, now let's look at the band structure. On the left hand side, you see silicon, energy versus wave vector. <clears throat> we know the band gap of silicon is around one electron volt. There's an indirect band gap. Gallium arsenide has a larger band gap, about 1.5 electron volts. It's a direct band gap. And that is the reason why it's used for optoelectronics and so forth. So you see that I copied that from C from 1981. So all of this is very old. Now let's look at graphene. Graphene looks very different. Graphene has what we call a Dirac-like band structure. So there is a linear dispersion, no parabolic dispersion, but a linear dispersion. And there is no band gap. In theory, you would argue that the density of states at the charge neutrality point or at the Dirac point, as it is called, would become infinitely small. But in reality, it's never zero. And there are many reasons for that. There's disorder broadening, there are electron-electron interactions, there's finite temperature and so forth. So there is never a gap for graphene. And if you don't have a gap, well, then it's difficult to confine charge carriers. Then it's a little bit like a metal. And in a metal, you also cannot confine charge carriers. But on the other hand, if you have a material that is composed of carbon, then we know that natural carbon consists of 99% carbon-12, which is an isotope that has no nuclear spin. So you get rid of hyperfine coupling just by using graphene or carbon nanotubes or some other system that contains carbon. Also, carbon is a light element. And spin orbit interaction roughly scales with the size of the atom along the periodic table. So it's one of the lightest elements. It's element number six of the periodic table with which you can build a solid. So one expects very long coherence times, spin coherence times, longer than in silicon. But this is theory, and these ideas are old, and there is no experimental proof of that yet. So no gap, no dot, no qubit. So what can you do? What you do is you take bilayer graphene. So these are two layers of graphene on top of each other. They are what is called Burnell stacked. So there's always one carbon atom within the hexagon of the uh, honeycomb lattice below. And now the dispersion becomes parabolic. You get two bands, but you still don't have a band gap. So you have a point, a charge neutrality point where in principle the density of states theoretically should go to zero, but for the same reasons as for single layer graphene, it doesn't, and you have parabolic bands. But the nice thing is you can apply a vertical electric field across these two graphene layers, and that breaks the symmetry between these two layers, and that opens up a gap. So basically what you do is you have these two parabolic bands, electrons and holes, and by using an electric field you change the symmetry, and that gives rise to an anti-crossing and to this parabolic band. Actually, if you look in detail, you see that it's not really parabolic anymore, but it has this little dip here in the center. It's what some people call a Mexican hat dispersion. And the gap sizes that you can achieve are of the order of 50 milli electron volts. So this corresponds to electric fields that you apply that are of the order of one volt per nanometer, which is a quite significant electric field. Now, 15 milli electron volts, that's not very much if you compare to silicon or to gallium arsenide. But if you work at dilution refrigerator temperatures, say at 100 milli Kelvin, then this is actually a huge energy scale. So for low temperature experiments, this is almost infinity. So if you blow this up, as I told you before, you get this. <clears throat> interesting Mexican hat dispersion, which has actually quite interesting properties for the experiments. So now, how do we build our sample? And the samples are built still in the good old way as developed by 
the Manchester Nobel laureates many, many years ago. Uh, we start out with a piece of graphite. Graphite is a wonderful metal. It has high conductivity and it is extremely flat, atomically flat. So it's the smoothest, best metal that you can find. Then we cover that with a piece of boronitrite. This is supplied by our Japanese collaborators. I think this is the best insulator in the world. I told you before that we can apply electric fields of one volt per nanometer or even more. That requires very perfect insulators and hexagonal boronitrite is one of those. So that's an insulator. <clears throat> then we put down a small flake of bilayer graphene. We cover this with another layer of boronitrite. So the whole graphene is now encapsulated and protected from the environment, no dirt anywhere anymore. Then we put source and drain contacts so we can measure electronic transport along this layer of graphene. We have a back gate, which allows us to apply a voltage from the back. <clears throat> and then we add another layer of insulator in the top gate so that we can locally apply this vertical electric field that I was talking about before. So here's a schematic of this sample. You see here the bilayer graphene in black, source and drain contact, top gate and back gate. And now you can study transport between source and drain or the resistance between source and drain as a function of one over T and by tuning basically the band gap with these two gate electrodes. And what you see here is that the resistance, its values up to 10 to the 10 ohms, 10 giga ohms. That's a huge value and that's actually limited by our experimental setup, could be even higher. And if you, uh, at, at least at uh, higher temperatures, you can fit some activated behavior and you get a band gap of 55 milli electron volts. I should say that getting these high resistances took us almost 10 years. So it is very obvious that there's a band gap has been discovered a long time ago. Also the magnitude of the band gap has been clear, but you need to make samples that are clean enough that there are no states in the band gap. Because if you have impurity states in the band gap, then you have hopping conduction through your sample and you never reach high resistance values. And as you know, if you want to switch off a transistor, you need a high resistance. The off state needs to be off. And uh, here is an example that shows that. Okay, now let's take this sample and let's take a split gate here. So we take two gate electrodes with a little gap in the center and we apply a top gate voltage to these split gates and the back gate such that there's a gap below the split gates and the Fermi energy is positioned in the gap. So now if you pass a current between source and drain, it has to go through this narrow channel. Now, you remember that geometry probably from gallium arsenide. This is uh, what is called a split gate geometry. And in gallium arsenide, what you would do is you would just apply more negative voltages to the split gate to laterally squeeze the channel. Now here, this is not possible because if you make these gate electrodes more negative, you at the same time, you shift the Fermi energy in this little gap here and you make your barrier conducting. So this doesn't work. In order to have a band gap below the split gate and to have the Fermi energy in the band gap, you cannot touch this gate electrode here. So what you do is you cover it with another insulator and yet another gate on top of this little constriction so that you can locally tune the Fermi energy in this little constriction. And if you do that, you can measure the conductance as a function of this little gate here on the top. And you see you can pinch off zero conductance for very negative voltages. And then you see very nicely quantized conductance <clears throat> as it has been seen in gallium arsenide back in the 1990s. I should emphasize here that this quantized conductance is an obvious effect to be expected, but it was not found for a very long time in graphene because nobody could make nice and smooth constrictions. Let me also emphasize that the plateaus occur in units of four E squared over H, and not two E squared over H as in gallium arsenide or other semiconductors, because graphene has a, an additional degeneracy. You have a factor of two for the spin plus a factor of two for the valley. So this Dirac cone or the parabolic dispersion for bilayer graphene, this occurs at two equivalent places in case space and that gives you this additional factor of two for the degeneracy. 
And I should also add here, this is just uh, quantized conductance. If you investigate that in a magnetic field, there are a lot of interesting features which are completely absent in gallium arsenide. And the reason is that the band structure really is not parabolic, but it's a Mexican head band structure. And that makes this very interesting. But I will not go into that here. Now, <clears throat> we want to build uh, quantum dots. So here you see the layout for the quantum dot. It's graphite decade. Then you have the bilayer graphene stripe. Then you have the split gates, the green ones. You tune them such that the current has to flow through this narrow channel. And then you have the blue gates, and the blue gates allow you to tune the chem chemical potential locally. So let's look at that in the following. On the right-hand side, you see the schematic. You see source and grain. You see the channel. In this case, it's a P-type channel. We have holes. And then there's this additional gate here on the top. So if this gate is not biased or at the same, is at the same voltage at, as the other gates, then there is conduction through the channel, and that's what you see here. Finite conduction, and you see in the source contact we have holes, in the drain contact we have holes, in the channel we have holes, Fermi energy is in the valence band, and there's finite conductance. Now we tune this gate to a regime where the Fermi level is in the band gap. So suddenly the Fermi level is in the band gap, and conduction is completely quenched. Now, in gallium arsenide, that would be it. But here, you can go further, and you can start loading electrons into the conduction band of this local area over here. And what you see is wonderful Coulomb resonances, one electron after the other. And the interesting thing is now that we have electrons in the quantum dot and p-dope leads. So the quantum dot here is confined by p-n junctions. That's actually quite unusual. Uh, that, that's basically impossible to do in semiconductors. Now you look at these peaks and you see they're very narrow. They have, seem to have a pattern and we can understand that pattern. So there's the first electron, second electron, third electron, fourth. There's, there's the same factor of degeneracy four as in the QPC. And then once you fill in electron number five, you fill in the next orbital state. <clears throat> so here's the blow up on the top, one, two, three, four, and you see the, the gate voltage is proportional to energy. So the energy that you have to pay to add an electron to your system, it's the charging energy, that's a capacitive energy. It might be a spin or a valley energy, which is uh, negligible here. And you have to pay the orbital energy if you go to a next orbital state. And you can see that the peaks one, two, three, four are basically equidistant. And then there's a larger gap here once you fill in electron number five, because you go basically from the S to the P state. Now, the wonderful thing about this device is it's all gate voltage defined. So you can invert all your gate voltages and you now you have holes which are confined by N-type source and drain contacts. And in the same device, you can switch back between electrons and holes. Again, something not possible in semiconductors. Now, let me show you just one feature which I think is very peculiar which is if you go, you fill in more electrons. So what we did before is was one, two, three, four. Then look at the next sequence of peaks. These are eight. So there's a larger gap after electron number 12. And then the next number of peaks, these are 12 peaks. And then there's a larger gap once you have filled in electron number 24. So what's the physics behind that? On the bottom plot, I show you the peak separation. And you see, Peak separations go down for electron number four, it goes up for the reason we discussed, goes down. Then for electron number 12 goes up, that's here. And then for electron number 24, it goes up again. And why is that? Well, we understand the first part. The first four electrons, they go in the one S state, two spin, two valley states, the generacy of four. Now the next state is a P state. The P state in two dimensions, at least if your quantum dot is round or square or has some symmetry in X and Y is twofold degenerate. So you get a twofold degeneracy for the P state in two dimensions, plus two for spin and two for valley. And that explains these eight electrons here. But now, how about these 12 here? So that's not so easy to understand because in two dimensions, an orbital state cannot have more than a twofold degeneracy. In three dimensions, you would have the D state and the D state would be three fold degenerate. But that's not the case in two dimensions because you are limited by the plane. So something else is going on. 
And here we got some help from our theory friends, Angelica Knote and Polotia Falco in Manchester. They actually calculated dot, and we found that it's uh, circular. And then they calculated the energy levels in this quantum dot. And this is now calculated without spin and without valley. So each of those points should be fourfold degenerate. So you see the first state, it's one because there's no spin and valley. Then you have two for P, and then it gets a little complicated. Now what happens is if you lower your energy and you make your dot larger, you remember that you have this Mexican hat dispersion for bilayer graphene. And in first approximation, it's a circle. It has circular symmetry. But of course, that is not true because it's embedded in an hexagonal lattice in K space. So it actually has threefold symmetry. It's called trigonal warping. This trigonal warping usually happens at high energies, but because of our large electric fields, we move it down. And therefore, we get an additional threefold orbital degeneracy. So you see, for a large quantum dot, all of these states occur in triples. And the reason is the trigonal warping in this state. So now if we go back to our experimental data, we understand the 12 electrons. That's a threefold degeneracy from trigonal warping, plus two for spin, plus two for valley, and we are there. Now, how do we fill electrons in these states? It's like the periodic table. So let's look at the first four uh, conductance resonances. And now we look at it as a function of parallel magnetic field. Parallel magnetic field is in the plane of the dot. So it couples to the spin but it does not couple to the valley because the valley is an orbital quantity. So you see the first two move to the left, they go down in energy, the next two go up. So that means the first two have the same G factor, the upper two have the same G factor. So we know exactly what's happening now. So we have spin down K, spin down K prime, spin up K, spin up K prime. These are the first four electrons. Now for the next eight electrons, you see the left four move to the left, the right four move to the right. So the left four have the same spin and the right four have the opposite spin. And they are paired now in units of K, K prime and P plus and P minus. And uh, if you now take this slope in energy, it's in gate voltage, you convert gate voltage to energy, then the slope is a G factor. <clears throat> And you can plot this G factor as a func or function of electron occupancy. And you see it's minus two, plus two, then four with minus two, four with plus two. And then you see it gets complicated. For the next 12, it's not so well defined. And the reason is probably that correlation effects play an important role. You could also say that our experiment is more difficult in that regime. But basically, we understand now how we fill in electrons into graphene quantum dots. Now, the interesting thing is that there is this degree of freedom, the valley splitting, and this valley splitting corresponds to a G factor. It's called the valley G factor. And the reason is <clears throat> that these valleys, they correspond to a Berry curvature in K space, and that effectively corresponds to a magnetic moment. It's a magnetic moment in K space, not in real space, but it behaves the same way in a magnetic field. So now you see the bottom axis is the perpendicular magnetic field. And you see that the states that we measure, they behave linearly as a function of magnetic field. If you convert the slope to a G factor, it's 30. So it's more than an order of magnitude larger than the G factor. And the reason for that is that it's this valley G factor, which uh, is a band structure effect. Now you have gate electrodes on your quantum dot and you can change the size of the quantum dot. So, and you know, if you squeeze your wave function in real space, it gets larger in K space. And therefore it explores more of this cur Berry curvature. And therefore you can tune that G factor here from 30 to 74 in this case, by just changing the size of the dot. And that's, if you think about a quantum computer, that's beautiful. If you have a spin qubit, the spin qubit has a spin G factor and the spin G factor comes from the band structure. And it can be changed to some extent, but not very much. The valley G factor, however, is a tunable feature of your qubit. And if you build a valley qubit, you can tune the two level spacing quite dramatically, simply with gate voltages. <clears throat> 
Now, <clears throat> uh, I, get, I know that you guys also work on condo in gallium arsenide, and a condo in graphene, we have looked for condo for years, couldn't find it. Finally, we, we, we could find it. You need to have a very special regime of tunnel coupling. This is a special transparency for, for Edson because he worked on condo in gallium arsenide. So <clears throat> what you see here is the conductance, now in this case for a four hole state, no holes, one hole, two hole, three hole, four hole, you see the conductance minima, you see the temperature dependence of this minima, and you see that they go opposite of what you expect, which is related to the condo effect. You see nothing happens for four holes, because for four holes, you have no net spin. If you fill in one electron, remember it has one spin direction or one hole, the second hole comes in with the same spin direction and the opposite value. So now you have, if you want, a paired spin pair. Then the third electron compensates for the first spin and the first, the fourth one lives to netto zero spin and therefore no condo effect anymore. So you can also do spin at valley blockade. Let me just flash that here without going into details. That's a very important thing in a double quantum dot to really measure spin coherence times. This is a standard in gallium arsenide and silicon, but it's also possible now in graphene. Uh, you can also do some time resolved experiments, which is important if you want to measure coherence. So you see here how electrons go in and out of these quantum dots and we see wonderful signals, but we don't understand them. And uh, that is ongoing work and we still have to work very hard on this. So let me close the first part of my talk. Graphene quantum dots is a new field. Uh, I think they are as good as silicon or gallium arsenide quantum dots. And the physics is richer. The physics is richer because you have a valid degree of freedom and because you have this fantastic band structure with trigonal warping, which offers also topological properties uh, to the quantum dots. So this is our new logo now. I hope you recognize this. Just dot it. Okay, now let's come to the twisting. Everybody likes twisting these days. And let me start out very basic. These are two graphene layers that you rotate with respect to each other. And you can see how this superstructure emerges, which is called the moiré pattern. And you can see that depending on the twist angle, you get uh, different shapes. And you can see that the smaller the twist angle, the larger the periodicity of the Mori pattern. So in principle, in the limit of zero angle, so untwisted, uh, there is no Mori pattern, but if you open a small angle, then you get a large periodicity. So this is the same in K-space. So you see these six Dirac cones, 3K, 3K prime states for one layer, the second layer has the same Dirac cones. They overlap in K-space. And if you have a larger angle, you have a larger mismatch in K between these two sets of Dirac cones. Okay, now <clears throat> let's look a little bit what happens with the band structure. What you see here on the left are two Dirac cones, two single layers of graphene. And they are separated in K-space. And as I told you, this separation depends on the twist angle in your system. On the right-hand side, you see a little bit smaller twist angle, and you see that these two Dirac coins come together. And what happens is that these bands up there start to anti-cross, and there's a specific angle, which was predicted by Alan McDonald and company to be about 1.1 degree, where these bands become very, very flat. And uh, many people work on that now. I think there's a whole army of theorists, not so many experimentalists. And there's the pioneering papers by the MIT group from Pablo, where they discovered superconductivity and the mod insulator. And meanwhile, there's a whole series of papers. I should say, however, that even today, there, is, there are less than 10 experimental groups that can see superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene. And of course, uh, there are still many open questions and that's the reason why there are many theorists working on that. Okay, now let me take you, let me start out by the opposite regime. Let's take a large twist angle, 22 degrees. Of course, I would like to tell you that we did this experiment on purpose, but we didn't. Uh, 
we wanted to build superconducting graphene and the twist angle didn't turn out to be one degree, but 22 degrees. And that can happen very easily. So what that means is that there, the periodicity of the Moray lattice is very small. And if you look at it in K space, it means that the space, the separation in K space between two equivalent K points is large. It's much larger than the Fermi wave fragment. In other words, if you have electrons in one of those two graphene layers, it travels around, it's highly mobile, uh, but it cannot scatter into the other layer because its K vector has not enough momentum to scatter into the other layer. So in other words, you have two layers which are electronically decoupled. And there's an early paper, again, by Pablo's group in the quantum Hall regime that also refers to that. So let me show you what we can do with that. On the top, you see a single layer of graphene, and the color scale indicates that there's a different density in the center as on the sides. Now, if we, this could also be bilayer, single layer, doesn't matter. Now you have a top gate and a back gate. So if you make one gate negative and one positive, that's this line, you change the electric field, but you don't change the carrier density. If you go in this direction, however, you change you make both more negative or both more positive, and that increases the electron density or the hole density. So this is the point where the carrier density is zero. And now you see all these lines here in conductance, here and here. And these lines, they occur because there's a PN junction. So basically, you see here, one gate is positive, one is negative. So what we have is we have a cavity built here and electrons that go through the sample that come from an n-type regime that see a p-n junction here, then they are confined by the next p-n junction. They can travel back and forth, interfere, and then leave. This is what we call fabry perot oscillations. And there's a long story behind that about Klein tunneling and so forth. I don't want to go into that. So you see very nicely, there are beautiful fabry perot oscillations, and either you do n-p-n or you do p-n-p, and uh, that depends on where you are in these two regions here. Now, this is untwisted bilayer graphene. Now I show you the same experiment with the two graphene layers, but now twisted by 22 degrees. And it looks quite similar. You see also gate voltages, uh, top gate, back gate. And you see there are lines here and lines here. So there is Fabry Perot, but you see there are not only lines, there's a pattern here. There's a cross-hatched pattern. What's going on here? Well, let me show you a close-up of that one. So this is the displacement axis. This is where the carrier density is zero. In this direction, we increase the carrier density. So you see here, there is nothing. So we have these two graphene layers, and it's N, 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 no P N junctions, no fabric parole. Now we go down here, and down here, there's a very narrow regime in gate voltage where we see one set of oscillation. And so now we have built a PN junction in one of the two graphene layers, but not in the other one. It has a slightly different density. And therefore we just see planar fabry perot oscillations. And then of course, there's this region over here where we have fabry perot oscillations in both, but they're completely independent. They don't care about each other. It's two patterns that go through each other. And that's the indication that these two layers don't talk to each other. The other thing that you can see is that here there are what we call charge neutrality lines. And you see they split. So what you can do now is you apply voltages to these two layers. And depending on the electric field, the top layer screens the field for the bottom layer or vice versa. And that means that the electric fields or the carrier densities in the two layers depend on each other. And because they are so close, it's electron-electron interaction. And you can see that from the separation of these two lines, we can directly understand that by making a very simple capacitor model. Top plate, bottom plate, dimensions of graphene. Thickness of the plate is thickness of graphene. Distance is distance between the two layers. Now on the left-hand side, you see the PZ orbitals of graphene, single layer graphene. And you see it typically has a thickness of an angstrom or something like that. Now you take bilayer graphene 
And you see how the charge density looks like for bilayer graphene. And you see the separation and where the charge is localized. Now, from our capacitive measurements, we can actually extract the separation between these two layers. And we can compare with this very simple calculation of the layers, and they match very nicely. So I would argue that this is the capacitor with the largest capacitance per unit area, because there's no way you can bring two capacitor plates closer to each other than two layers of graphene. On top of that, you do a simple capacitance measurement, and it allows you to measure atomic distances. And all of that because of the large twist angle. Okay, this is what we found accidentally, but of course, it's a very nice result. Now, let's make it even more complicated. Let's take two bilayers. So we take an untwisted bilayer system and another untwisted bilayer system, and we twist them with respect to each other. So I always show you the same thing. This is what we call the charge, the voltage diagram. So there's a top gate and a bottom gate on these two layers. And by applying a vertical electric field, we can induce a carrier density, but we can also induce a vertical field. So now we have these two layers. And now you see this is the carrier density axis. This is what we call displacement field because along this line, the density is zero. The total density of the system is zero which doesn't mean that the densities in the two systems have to be zero. The total density of the system is zero. Actually, it turns out that we find two zero density lines, you see these two lines, that correspond to the zero density of each of the two bilayers individually. And if you do the experiment, the color scale is conductance. You see these lines and you see something very interesting. No applied voltage to both gates you see very low conductance. Low conductance means there's a gap. So we have not done anything, not applied any voltage. We have just taken two bilayer systems, put them on top of each other, and we open a gap. How is that possible? Well, the story is the following. Let's have a closer look. Here are the four graphene layers. The two ones belong together, the bottom ones belong together, and the two pairs are twisted in this particular case, also with a relatively large angle. So they're electronically decoupled, similar as the single layers were decoupled before. Now, if I look at the top graphene layer, it has a bottom neighbor, which is graphene, and on the other side, it has boron nitrite. The same is true for the bottom graphene layer. But the two graphene layers in the center, they have a graphene layer on either side. So, the electric bonding and the boundary conditions for the two middle layers is different than for the two outer layers. So we have already broken the symmetry by just putting the two layers on top of each other. And what that means is that because we have broken the symmetry, we have an electric field in each of the two bilayers, which is opposite in the two bilayers. So the total electric field is zero, as you see, no applied voltage. But the local electric fields in the two bilayers are opposite and equal in size. And you remember, an electric field in a bilayer system opens a gap. So what we have done now is we have opened a gap just by putting two layers with a large angle on top of each other. It is very simple single particle physics. What you need is a change in boundary condition. And people who do DFT calculations, they usually assume that there is vacuum on the other side. But that's actually not true here. It's boronitrite. And you have to take into account that boronitrite. And then you see that you can exactly get this symmetry breaking that we observe here in the experiment. OK, now let's lean back a little bit and looks, let's look at this twisting business. So I told you one degree, that's what is called the magic angle, where you have flat bands, at least for twisted single layers. and the closer, the smaller you make this twist angle, the stronger these layers are coupled. For zero twist angle, there's strong coupling, then you have bilayer graphene. And the larger you go with the twist angle, the more independently you can control the layers. You can then think of this plate capacitor where you do have electrostatic interaction, but the carriers live in different layers. So now we want to reach a regime where the layers are coupled 
but it can still independently tune the layers. So here is twisted double bilayer graphene. Oops, sorry. And here you see one version with 10 degrees, one with 1.17 degrees. For the 10 degree sample, you see again, the high resistance at zero gate voltage. That's what we discussed before. If you go to smaller angles, you see that this disappears. The conductance is quite high at no applied field. And that means that the two bilayers are coupled now. So no gap anymore. Gaps occur on the other hand for large displacement fields, but that's something we understand because that's just bilayer graphene at a field and you get a gap. And there are additional gaps at so-called fillings of the, the new unit cell in the system. That's well known. Now, what happens exactly for these angles? I show you now, that's a complicated plot, but I'll walk you through that plot. That's again, top gate versus spec gate, but now measured in a small magnetic field. And the small magnetic field gives rise to Landau levels. And so if you see periodic features here, that simply means that we observe Shuknikov the Haas oscillations in the system. So again, if we go along this off diagonal line, this is total carrier density zero, no electric and electric field changes, displacement field. Or if you go along the white dashed line, that means no effective field across the device, but we apply the same voltage to top and back gate. Now, there are some simple regions. For example, here on the upper left, there is one set of lines. That means we have one kind of carriers. Same is true here on the upper right, for example, or on the lower left. These are regions in phase space where only one kind of carrier contributes to transport. So now, what, what does the band structure look like schematically? I told you bilayer graphene has a parabolic band structure. Now you have two parabolas shifted in case space because you have the twisted layers. And you have two parabolas for the valence band as well. Now, if we uh, apply a vertical electric field, we shift these with respect to each other because the field that the bottom and the top layer see are different. And now you can imagine that if you go to this configuration here, there's a possibility for the Fermi energy to be just here. There's only one set of carriers that contributes to transport. If you go higher in energy, you get two conduction band contributions. If you go lower in energy, then two bands contribute to the valence band transport. And if you go, for example, to the situation here, you see this cross-hatched pattern, and that is originates from two kinds of carriers that occupy the band structure. And depending on your field and your Fermi energy, you can look into that. And it looks very complicated, but actually you can understand all of it simply take two parabolic dispersions for conduction and for valence band, and then have another set that are offset in case space, and you play with them in case space, you play with them with a displacement field and you play with the position of the Fermi energy and you can understand this diagram. But what I want to discuss with you is a very peculiar situation where we tune the system to a situation that you see on the bottom right. So now we only see a parabolic conduction band from one layer that overlaps with a parabolic valence band from the other layer. And we can put the Fermi energy such can see that immediately that the total number of carriers is zero. I should say the carrier density is zero, but we do have a population here in this conduction band and in this valence band. So we get overlapping bands, and people sometimes call this band inversion. And because we can tune the overlap of the bands with the field, and we can tune the position of the Fermi energy with the gate voltages, we can exactly go to that situation. And uh, that's basically along this line. And if you look very closely along this line, let me show this to you here. That's the situation sketched again. I'm only focusing on that one now where these two bands overlap in energy space. So if you look at zero carrier density, that's the situation where you have the same number of electrons in one layer as you have holes in the other. You see again, dark blue here. And dark blue in this particular case means high resistance. So we do see a gap. Rather than having electrons and holes traveling in parallel, 
we do see a high resistance when we would like to understand that. We also see Landau levels left and right. This is magnetic field dependence, which correspond exactly to the Landau fields of the electrons and the holes from the two bands. So again, these electrons in these holes, they are very close to each other. They are as close as an atomic distance. And so they pair up. So this is what people call an excitonic insulator. So this has been observed in other solids before, but this particular configuration for the relatively intermediate angle allows you coupling between the layers as well as tuning of the layers and allows you to go exactly to that regime where you have these excitonic insulators and that's the reason that you have high resistance. So here you see the resistance <clears throat> as a function of density. You see it peaks nicely at zero density. You can measure it as a function of temperature uh, and you see it decays for high temperatures that allows you to get a gap out of it by doing some activation analysis. And that roughly agrees with what you expect from the calculation. And this calculation was done by Xi'an Tzu and Alan MacDonald, where they basically have these two bands overlapping. But you see, because of interactions, these two bands anti-cross each other. And that's exactly the gap that we observe in transport. So you see, this is a, another way of making correlations important by playing with the angle, playing with the number of layers, and playing with the fields that you can tune with the gate voltages. Okay, now let me finally come to magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. I told you that there are probably less than group, 10 groups around worldwide that can do superconductivity, and uh, we tried very, very hard, and finally we got it to go. So this is data or schematics from the original cow paper from the MIT group. I have shown this to you before. On the right-hand side, you see the band dispersion. Uh, this is two graphene layers twisted by 1.1 degree. And the important thing is that you get this very flat band at zero energy. And a flat band means a very large effective mass, which means very slow carriers, which means interactions are very important. Now, here is again a plot uh, from the original paper. This is temperature versus carrier density. And when you have uh, dark blue, that means very low resistance. Uh, I should maybe add as an experimentalist that all the resistances that we and others have measured are relatively high compared to what people in standard superconductors have measured. So it's not really a super low resistance, but there are many other indications that it's a superconductor. And there are actually reasons that we understand why the resistance is not so small. And then there are these phases here as a function of temperature and carrier density that play a role here. Now, this is uh, our data. This is basically the current voltage through the system. And you see for low enough temperatures, you see this step-like behavior, which means you get a current for zero voltage, uh, that superconductivity, and that starts disappearing once you raise the temperature or the current. Now, we, we are device builders, as you have seen. We like quantum dots and stuff like that. So we decided to build the simplest possible device in a superconductor, and that's a Josephson junction. So what you have here is a superconductor separated by an insulator. And this is a standard device that many people have investigated. Now here, it's particularly simple because you can tune twisted bilayer graphene to be superconducting or insulating just by gate voltages. So you can think of it like playing the piano. You have your gate electrodes on top. And I say, I want it to be superconducting here, and I want it to be insulating here, and maybe even ferromagnetic over there. That's yet to come, but in principle possible. And what you see on the right-hand side is basically our measurement result. It's the voltage between the two superconductors as a function of the current. And you see very nice this hysteresis. This is well understood and known for Josephson junctions. So you basically see how the current, so there is a super current that flows through the insulator. And then once your bias voltage is large enough, the super current breaks down. And because of the capacitances in the system, you get a hysteretic effect. So now you have our device, this is this magic angle twisted bilayer graphene embedded between hexagonal boronitride, graphite becade. We take two gold gates on top, we cover it with an insulator, have another gate on top. And now you see we can have basically 
three different regions here. We have a back gate that changes the entire density. Then we have these two outer gate electrodes left and right to tune there the electron density. And in the center, we have a gate where we can locally tune the density again. That is already interesting because you can make a superconductor with varying length. So um, this is the situation. We call this the density in the leads, the density in the junction, and the density in the leads. And this is an SEM of our sample. You see the center gate, the two side gates, the source of grain contacts. And this is the phase diagram that we are looking at. On the right is, again, the band structure from the MIT paper. On the bottom, you see our current versus density paper, and you see this nice peak here that corresponds to superconductivity in the whole regime, and there's a smaller peak in the electron regime. So it looks very similar to what people have shown in the literature. Now we start building our junctions. We park our leads here in the superconducting regime, and we tune the density here in the junction itself. That's the plot that I have shown you in this regime. And now we can actually tune the lead density over a wide range. So we have a Josephson junction where we can tune, if you want, the TC of the lead while keeping the density or the properties of the insulator the same. So we go along this lane, we go from dispersive bands to flat bands, and we can measure basically what happens to our Josephson junction. And uh, here there are three examples now. You see the center junction, you can make it as narrow as 100 nanometers. And then you see very nicely how you see the supercurrent coming up and going down again as you go through the superconducting transition in the junction. You can also use the other two gates and you can make the junction 650 nanometers or 1400. And even for the longest one, we do see Josephson junction behavior. That means our Cooper pairs, they go through an insulating junction that is 1.4 microns in length. It's something which we don't understand. But it means that the coherence length has to be at least as long as that one. Now, uh, you can also build a, a superconductor, superconductor junction by having different superconductors in series. There's a, a lot of things you can do. You can apply high frequency, and that's basically one of the hallmarks of Josephson junctions. You provide a frequency which has a frequency that matches basically the gap size. And then what happens to your current voltage characteristic that you get these additional steps, which are called Shapiro steps. And that's very nicely shows that uh, we see indeed here for Josephson junction. So here is the critical current basically plotted uh, as a function of the power of this microwave frequency that you apply. And you see the higher the power that you apply, the larger the voltage of your microwave signal. And so you have steps of one, steps of two, steps of three, and, and so forth, which is well understood and shows that this is really a nice Josephson junction in your system. Okay. now. Let me come to the end and let me dream a little bit. So we can build Josephson junctions in graphene. Uh, we built quantum dots in graphene. It's, uh, this is a magic angle twisted layer graphene. This is untwisted, but maybe this could also be in the twisted layers with uh, various gaps. We have topology in our system. We have barely degrees of freedom in our system, which others, uh, other materials usually don't have. So we think that this is a very unique setting where you can play in the very same material with different physical properties that you can all locally control by gate voltages. And so you could think, for example, of having superconducting qubits next to semiconducting qubits or quantum dots and use them for purposes where they are best at. So that brings me to the end. Let me first thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for greetings from Zurich to Uberlandia. Here you see our team. Uh, and I showed you basically graphene quantum devices, which I think have matured a lot. Uh, and twisted graphene layer, which is at this point almost an infinite zoo of things that you can do. Thank you very much for your attention. Klaus, thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. So we are uh, open to questions. Anyone 
who wants to ask a question can open the microphone, please. Hey, uh, hey, George. Can you hear Hi, me? Carlos. How are Hi. you? Hi. Hey, Hi, Carlos. Hey, Klaus. How's that? How's it going? Very well. Thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm actually trying to click with my uh, camera here, but I'm not succeeding, I suppose. I would love to see you. <laughs> I did start start sharing, but apparently that's not a very friendly environment here. There's a <laughs> there's a little uh, you know stop sign here, but anyway, it, um, it's a little bit clunky, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let me ask you a quick question. Um, everyone, thank you for your nice talk. Um, it's great, really insightful. Um, did I understand you correctly that when you have this band inversion? Um, you can actually hope to see Cairo. I'm going to say the M word here, Cairo Myronas in this um, system. <laughs> okay, thank you for your question. Yes, um, I mean, the, this picture here uh, at the very end, uh, you could also add Majoranas in principle. I think for Majoranas, what you would need is spin orbit interaction. But actually, that is also not so difficult because you can add a uh, transition metal dichalcotonite and uh, put it directly on graphene. So it's an insulator with strong spin orbit interaction, and you can induce spin orbit interaction in graphene. So we are thinking of how that could possibly be done. But I mean, at least uh, as a PowerPoint sketch, I can immediately design the sample. You take your magic angle bilayer graphene, you add some transition metal dichalcotonite locally to induce uh, spin orbit interaction, and then you have all the ingredients that you need in principle to see Majoranas. So I, I know that's a little simple minded, and uh, doing it is utterly complicated, but I think, yes, in principle, one could go along this line. Great. You know, like, you know, some of the predictions, I think, by Yaroslav, right, you know, from Regensburg, mm -hmm. Fabian, right? by adding this mm -hmm. transition matter, you can increase the spin orbit. Just a quick one. Can I, another one, George, just briefly? Sure, sure. sure. Then uh, we have Luis uh, on, the, on the line. Yeah. Any insights on, on, on the mechanism of uh, superconductivity there? You know, phonons oh. versus, you know, loop in your cone. Okay, so at this point, no, no insight of what the nature of superconductivity is, but it's clear when we can build a Josephson junction, we can build a squid. I mean, I'm saying we can build a squid. <laughs> we, we are in the process of building a squid. We have the first one that looks now like a squid. And uh, if you have a squid, you can measure the phase relation between the two contacts. And that should tell you whether it's an S or a P wave superconductor. So not with the data that I have shown you here, but if you build a squid, you can contribute to the understanding. Yeah, yeah but no, but I mean, can you really tell apart what would be, what would be the signature though, whether it's phonon or electron mediated or, you know, electron electron interaction, or can you see something like, you know, I know free delta type oscillations, which because this would somehow be related to the attractive pairing in the in the non convention let's call it non conventional you know looped in your cone mechanism right yeah so i i i think what you mentioned could be i mean i could conceive an experiment which is also very difficult which is built uh, a quantum dot in twisted bilayer graphene where the quantum dot is superconducting now whatever that means i don't know what a superconducting quantum dot is but at least the energy spectrum will contain the flat bands and then you couple that or confine it by either a trivial insulator or a correlated insulator, and you measure single, I don't know, Cooper pair transport through this confined island. And I think this way one could learn something about whether phonons play a role or not. But again, Great. quite a tough experiment. Great, thank you. Thanks for a nice talk and uh, great thanks. to see you. Yes, thanks for the nice question. Uh, we have uh, Luis, Luis Diaz on on the line now. Uh, hi, Klaus. Hi, Jordan. Hi, Trying Luis. To, uh, let, let me see if I. Yeah, I think I I am luckier than Carlos. 
I can share my, my privileges. My VIP, camera. what can I say? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> privileges. <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 my computer So, well, uh, thanks, uh, Klaus, for the very nice talk. Uh, very inspiring. So I, I actually have two questions also. One re regarding the, the condo in the, in the, in the dot and another one regarding the Joseph junctions. So let, let me start with the dot. So I actually saw, saw the paper and, um, I understand you guys did some scalings of, you know, temperature scalings of on, on the different valleys and find some signatures of SU4 uh, condo. Mm -hmm. is, is that correct? Or can, can you elaborate on this? Well, um, so that would of course be wonderful if we, ha if we would see a clean SU4 condo. Okay. What we actually, and then of course it depends where you are, right? For one electron, uh, in principle, you have four, four degrees of freedom that are degenerate, but it turns out that we all know that spin orbit coupling is weak in graphene, but it's okay. not zero. And for the low temperatures that we are looking at, it's actually relevant. So the spin orbit coupling is, uh, there are now various papers by different groups. I would say it's something between 60 and 100 micro electron volts. So it's a small number, but large enough to lift that degeneracy. And therefore it's, if you do the temperature scaling, you find an SU2, behavior and it's actually consistent with that uh, splitting. If you go to more holes or electrons, mm -hmm. uh, temperature scaling um, is not always straightforward. It's straight, I mean, you, you look at the data here, you can see it, right? For the first hole and for the third hole, we can do nice scaling. For the second hole, the temperature dependence is so weak that we cannot make a strong statement. It goes in the right direction, we do see a zero bias anomaly. It all looks like a condo effect, but the scaling here has a huge error bar. And and can can you uh, open the dot a little bit to to increase the condo temperatures so that maybe you <laughs> have a better scaling? I mean, away from from the spin orbit gap. Well, you know, we were we are working with these graphene quantum dots for. 10 years now, and every time there was one cold, we said, let's look for condom, it has to be there. <laughs> and it was never there. Okay. I think we understand better now why it is as difficult as it is. Um, so I have to be honest with you that this is the only quantum dot that we investigated in great detail. There are others that show a little bit of condo, but it's not so simple to, to tune it. And you see, the problem is in Gallio Marcinite, the tunneling barriers can be controlled from nothing to everything because yeah. you have a band gap. Here, if you open it too much, you're always limited. You have to keep your Fermi energy in the band gap in the lead. And there is, we cannot completely close it. I mean, I showed you we can go to giga ohms, but in Gallium Marcinite, you can go to one electron per week. That's not possible here. At the same time, we cannot open it as much as we can in Gallium Marcinite. I so see. We are limited, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Now, now the other, the other question is related to the Josephson junctions. So I understand that there is no magnetic field, uh, so that your phase difference is fixed, right? Yep. But yes. but you you did mention the squid. So so do you, do you have a geometry where you can thread a flux and actually change the see, say, Josephson oscillations and things like that? That's the plan. We have a sample that uh, will be cooled down hopefully next week, um, but we have no data. Okay. And I think the sample won't work for, for various reasons. So, but it's something that is absolutely doable. If you can make a Josephson junction, you can make a squid. You have, just have to work hard. Okay. You know, if the yield for the Josephson junction is 10%, the yield for two doses and junctions is 1%. But that's not the, that's not the issue of the theoreticians. That's okay. what we have to do in the lab. And, and okay, well, yeah, that'd be, be interesting to see. All right, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much.
Thanks for your question, Luis. Now we have Nancy. Nancy wants to ask a question. Nancy? Nancy's she's there. She was, at least. Oh, Nancy I is see. Uh, trying. Uh, Hi, Klaus. Uh, that's the other side. That's the other side of the couple. <laughs> Good to see can you, you Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Perfectly well. Yes. Perfectly well. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so let me let me give my speak, speaker yeah. to Nancy. Let me say go speed and speak. Take mine. That, hi, Nancy. Yeah. Okay. That's hi, hi. Yeah. Hi, Klaus. Hi, Nancy. Fantastic, fantastic oh. talk. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I have a question. Sorry about the 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 camera. I. For some reason, I never can connect properly to this um, um, frame that they use here. Yeah, uh, these Brazilians, you, guys, you know. Uh, yeah, we, we are very complicated. Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, no, it's on my side. So, so, yeah, no, you cannot put the camera either. So he's trying to. Okay, so the question, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, you that um, people are using the quantum dots in silicon inside, oh, inside the, um, the optical cavities in order to control the, um, the qubit. Here I am. Hi. So, so in order to control the qubit and also to um, measure it in a kind of non-invasive way, I was wondering if you can put your quantum dots inside optical cavities and if you can comment on the difficulties or so by optical cavity i assume you mean microwave cavity yes mm -hmm. yes that's right yes yeah yes yes we are trying very hard so we have done that for gallium arsenide for many mm -hmm. years now we are doing the same thing for graphene you no, it, it's an obvious thing it has to be done let me just give you one example why it's much harder. And the reason is, you see, what you do is you have a quantum dot, and then you mm -hmm. come with a gate, and this gate is coupled to the resonator. Now, mm -hmm. our graphene quantum dot sits on a piece of graphite, which is a fantastic conductor. So now you come in with your electrode from the side, and part of this uh, line that goes to the, oh, I'm with the wrong arm here, uh, part of that, there is graphite below. So it's a huge capacitive mm -hmm. short. So what mm -hmm. that means that the signal that we see from the dot is is covered by the signal that we see from the graphite backgate. Now you would say, of course, get rid of the graphite backgate. But yes. if we get rid of the graphite backgate, we cannot tune our dot anymore because we need an electrode from top to bottom. So yeah. We need this displacement field to get the confinement right. Okay, so all of that can be solved. We just need now to make a gate, which is exactly the size of the dot, dot and stops at the edge of the dot so that the line is not short. Yeah, That's I was thinking trying. about, yeah, couldn't you cut it? Yes. That's what we are trying right now. It's something okay. that uh, okay. you see for silicon or for gallium arsenide, you don't need a back gate. So you don't have yeah. the short, but we do need a backgate. We cannot get rid of the backgate. So, but it's a purely technical problem, and I'm sure we will solve it one way or another. It will take time, but it has to be done. You're absolutely right. Okay, okay. Because it would be very cool to see, uh, to to interrogate the dot with um, with a cavity in a kind of non-invasive way, or measure the cavity directly as a me that would be that would be nice to see here. Okay. Absolutely. And in case okay, that was my question. Is, yeah, you're absolutely right, Nancy. And in case the spin coherence is as long as the theorists predict, that should be yeah. actually an easy experiment. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that would be. Okay, here I pass the torch. Hello, Mr. Sergio, long time no see. I, I have a question. Can you do um, come to the light here? So can, can you um, 
can say basically landscape the potential using the dielectric field, like in your exotonic insulator. You modulate the boron nitride and then change the binding energy. And you, because you might be able to then find this exotonic insulator in long channel and, and play around the status. Um, so, Sergio, do I understand correctly? You want to confine the excitonic insulator, for example, by a standard insulator, or or you want to put it on a different dielectric? Right, right. Putting on a different dielectric, a different dielectric thickness, for example. That is when we would change the dielectric binding. So you can have your plane. And if you modulate the thickness of your boron nitride, then in principle the binding energy will change. You could have a stronger or a weaker yep. binding right. in space. <clears throat> yeah, I see your point. So uh, what we typically do is uh, our boron nitride is typically 20 to 30 nanometers in thickness. That's just because you see it nicely in the optical microscope. But you could do it at three nanometers. And then it should be very different. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, haven't done it. Yes, but it should make it worse, I assume, right? When the metal is close by, it probably helps screening. Oh, it helps screening. Right. Mm -hmm. It will make the binding smaller. Right. Would make the binding smaller, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but, but that way you could then have a line of this exotonic insulator instead of the plane. Ah, I understand now. So you want to pattern the insulator. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting idea. So far we have not patterned the boron nitride, but you can etch it, yeah. It should be possible. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah thanks. You might by the way, just just a, a comment is that it's a bit connected with Carlos's question in that. Presumably, the mechanism is the conductivity and the twisted by layer, right? It's electronic, then presumably it will be very sensitive to electric binding. And, and so somehow yep. it is it is very hard to do another another lab, it seems. Yes. I'm I mean, for for the uh, superconductivity, there is an experiment by the Efyatov group, right, where they take very thin boron nitride and they get rid of the correlated insulator, but not rid of the superconductivity, which seems to indicate that the electronic correlations are not dominant. Mm -hmm. no. But I only know this one experiment by the Efyatov group. I don't know the others. All of them use the roughly the same thickness of boron nitride. Thank you, Sergio. Mm -hmm. oh, this mm -hmm. is so nice yeah, to see you, so many by the way, for inviting us to this. Yeah, thank party. you. You are coming? <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I meant to yeah. this party. <laughs> to this party. This party today. Okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> So um, nice to see all of you. Can can I add that I like the the um, uh, mention of the American cup, or it will be <laughs> so sensitive. Well, I think I think I think I'll mute I'll mute Nancy. She should. Yeah. <laughs> I I was waiting for you to say something. <laughs> well, I was waiting for you to say something. What what took you so long? What <laughs> took you so long? <laughs> A gold medal is more important. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually support Argentina this time. Uh, uh, well, I should say, a second gold medal is more important. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for my <laughs> for my comments here, but I think everybody knows what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions, anyone? Um, I do have one. Uh, Edson, please. Um, 
I did, my question is in connection with the synorps interaction and the, uh, the two double twisted layers. So at there, you have two, at the total electric field is zero, but locally could be strong. So would that be strong enough to induce hard in orbiting material? Um, very good question. Um, there is there is Rashba spin orbiting graphene, and there are experiments, not from us, but from other groups, that show that it is tunable. Uh, but uh, at least the numbers that I know mean that the spin orbit is weak and its tunability is even weaker. Mm -hmm. um, which I find somehow surprising because the electric fields that we can apply in graphene are much higher than it was ever possible in semiconductors. So if you just look at the electric field, but the coefficient, of course, in front of the electric field is very small. So from what I have seen so far, it's not very useful. Mm -hmm. But Again, I would could imagine that heterostructures, including transition metal ticalcogenides, could make a difference here, because that could change the coefficient that you have in front of your electric field. No good. Yeah. Uh, thank you. By the way, nice talk. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Ah, wonderful. Thank you, Edson. Next, Next time, time I have to be there in person. Hopefully. Um, Klaus, I have a I have a quick question. You showed uh, the in the superconducting results. You showed the picture that have two two superconducting domes, one side by side to the other. Uh, they they had a, a dashed line around them. This one. Uh, yeah. No, there was another one before. I think it was. Uh, someone else's results a little bit before uh there yeah, there yeah. uh well that's that's uh that has been seen already that's not your result right yes that's the result from the mit group so, uh, is, is there any anything interesting going on with this a change of uh, uh order parameter or something why why two two superconducting domes does anyone know? No, I don't think so. I okay. don't think anybody knows whether there are different kinds of superconductivity for one carrier type. These are all holes, right? These are negative okay. density. Okay. And it could even be that superconductivity for electrons and holes has a different origin. Okay. I mean, we always find an enormous asymmetry. I think every every sample shows it, it seems holes are always better than electrons. That's, I, don't know, I don't know. That why. sounds like uh, cuprates. That's the result you see in cuprates. Doping with uh, electrons is a weaker superconductivity and it's stronger with holes mm -hmm. in the cuprates. Except so. that here the, the band structure should should be roughly electron hole symmetric. I'm not sure that's okay. true in the cuprates. Yeah. Uh, but, no, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, well, I am curious why why there are so few groups that can see superconductivity. Is it is this the sample preparation or the device preparation that is the problem, or it's a measurement uh, problem? No, measurement is simple. It's the it's making the device. Okay. And you see, uh, the problem is. Uh, whether your device is superconducting or not, you only know once you have done all of that. So it would be very nice if you take two layers, you twist them, and then you have an experimental method that tells you whether the twist angle is good before you do all contacting and gates and stuff like that. Okay. And you, you can do that, for example, with an STM, but when you do STM, then it's not covered with boron nitride, and if you take it out of your STM, it gets dirty. Okay. So, so it would be wonderful, for example, if there were an optical method 
some Raman peak or something like that, where you put your sample under the Raman and the Raman says, ah, oh, wrong angle, make a new sample. But we have to go through the entire process to only find out at the end of the day, ah, it was 1.3 degrees. Okay. And that makes the process very slow. So okay. what we do now is we make samples that have many, many, many contacts because the angle is also not constant. It varies across the sample. So when you have many contacts, you can measure a lot of different combinations and then you can see in which region there is the best hope for superconductivity before you put down your gate. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for, I, is there any other, uh, any other questions? If not, uh, let's uh, thank Klaus again. Thank you so much for the, for your talk and thank you. Uh, sure. Sure, Carlos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. I think um, I got a bit jealous now. I managed to, I'm very secretive, so let me uncover my. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. Damn it. I tried, so, I tried it to was not, you. It was not about friendship. It was about being dumb and not clicking to allow myself sharing my, uh, my, <laughs> my camera. <laughs> anyway, let me go quickly. Uh, uh, you mentioned this very interesting result with the G factor varying quite a bit. But we know in gallium arsenide and, and things like that, and you know this very well because you worked on that um, a long time ago, right? Um, by shifting the wave function, you can sort of engineer, you know, the, the G factor, right? So what is actually the, the fact, uh, the, the main factor here that is changing this, this, um, the G factor so much? Because the spin orbit in gallium arsenide and other two, five, three, five compounds, it's one over the gap and, and one of the, the capital, you know, uh, delta, the usual delta, the spin orbit, the split off band that controls the gap, the, um, the G factor and the effective masses by, you know, for, for that matter. So what is actually the main contribution here that you guess? When you say it's just a band structure effect, what do you guess is the most important thing that is changing here when, uh, to see that? Well, uh, thanks, Carlos, for this question. So in gallium arsenide, you, you can change the G-factor, the electronic G-factor, the spin G-factor by 10% on a good day, right? You cannot change it by a factor of two by shifting wave functions. The G-factor I was talking about here is the valley G-factor. I should emphasize that. It's not a spin G-factor. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. The spin G-factor, I mean... Uh, within the accuracy that we can measure doesn't change. Yeah. Okay. But the okay. valley G factor, it directly lifts from this uh, Berry curvature, which comes, I know, I don't know what to say. It has to do with the Mexican hat or the American hat or some kind of a hat in the band structure. Wine bottle, wine bottle uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's profile. That's the, the more politically correct way to say like the wine bottle <laughs> profile. Right? Okay. Yeah, you know what I mean, right? Yes, up and down, I do. up, plus trigonal warping that gives rise to this valley G factor. Yeah. Okay. And, and then how that it depends where your energy is in that little maximum with respect to the minimum. And on, while we're at, at at this, um, when you vary your energy, the Fermi energy to be, you know, say scanning through the the the, the wine bottle profile or the Mexican hat profile. And do you actually measure the Shubinikov that has in this regime? And can you actually see the electron and whole orbit, the different types that happen in this regime? Yes, absolutely. You can see that. And uh, there is a there's a lift shift transition, right? Because the topology of the Fermi surface changes as you go through the maximum. If you're on top of the maximum, it's a simple circle. Once you go below the maximum then you have a hole in the center and uh, that gives directly rise to different degeneracies and should be off the ass yes. because this is exactly what what happens in, in in topological insulators right you know things like the indium and timonide you know this rui rui type of um you know um, double well right where you have electrons on one side and hole on the other side and to make them you know invert so you also have some That's kind it. of you know mexican hat there and uh, and that makes it, the Shubinikov the house very funny, and 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 also as a means to probe this topology of of the band structure, right? You know whether mm -hmm. it's Max and Hadron. Can you vary this the degree of 
Mexican hatness of this yes. with the gates? Yes. Yes. Right. yes. And the Fermi it's level. The, yes. Okay. It's the electric field that yeah. controls the height, the, the height of the hat. Independently from the, the carrier density, do you have more than one gate? So you have two gates, top and back gate. The difference between the two gate voltages is the height of the hat. The absolute value of the gate voltages gives you the position of the Fermi energy. So if you fix the position of the Fermi energy and the height of the hat, your gate voltages are set. Then you can't change anything anymore. Right. Great. Wow, that's wonderful. And this is in one of these papers you mentioned, right? Is this the Rick, Rick, Rick House uh, preprint? Uh, I took I took note here, or this, you know, some, it, there's an archive paper from the, you know, last so year. So are you talking? Yeah. So it depends what you mean. It, the the, oh, uh, the, the Shubinikov the has the Shubinikov the has in the Maxon hat. Do you have data for that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's in the, there's a paper already published where this is in. Okay. Great. Right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And once again, very nice seeing you again. And yes, so hope to see you soon. <laughs> nice hope to see you, all of you soon. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I will uh, I will send a new uh, send you an email soon asking for the for the slides so that we can post together with the video in our YouTube channel. Okay. Okay.